Hello, 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 and welcome to the caregiver preview for contraception literacy. My name is Christy Abel, and it is uh, my distinct honor on behalf of Rethink Sex Education to present to you this information on not getting pregnant. All right, let's dive in. But before we do, I would like to recognize and appreciate that I am an invited guest in the traditional territory of the Sawathan and Musqueam First Nations. I have the privilege to work, live, play, and learn in this beautiful place, and I'm committed to being a steward of this land. I express gratitude to the Coast Salish community and all Homohoyan speaking people and offer my respect to all elders who have gone before us and First Nations people who are with us today. I encourage you to do the same wherever in the world you may be. Heishka. All right, so who am I? If you've watched my other videos, you can skip through this part, okay? Uh, but in case this is your first time, um, like I said earlier, my name is Christy Abel. I'm a certified sexual health educator through the graduate program of rehabilitation medicine at the University of Alberta. I have a master's degree in counseling from UVic. I have a bachelor of education from the UBC, and it all started way back in 1994 at UBC. I did not know what I wanted to do, but I ended up with a bachelor of English lit. And then as for my experience, after I got my B.Ed., I went on to become a high school teacher for eight years, English, French, and what we would call the dog's breakfast. I taught pretty much everything <laughs> in the school at least once. Uh, then I got my master's degree in uh, 2008 and I still waited a year to, to go in because I was coaching volleyball at the time and had made some promises to my team. Anyways, uh, and I still do that. Okay, so I still work in high school as a counselor. I actually love being a trusted adult in young people's lives. And I hope that I will become a trusted adult in your child's life in terms of their sexual health. All right. And I was the district lead for sexual health education of my school district for a couple of years and then hashtag budget cuts. But you know what? I wouldn't be doing this channel if I was still doing that job. So there's a silver lining to everything. And of course, I am the founder and CEO of Rethink Sex Ed, which was incorporated in 2021 and is still going. <clears throat> I'm also the mom of two kids with my wonderful partner, Ben. Uh, I am an animal lover. We got lots of animals in this house. <laughs> I'm a baseball and volleyball coach. I've had my own therapy practice. I'm now a YouTuber um, and I love being outside, especially on the water. And we just got a couple of kayaks and we are loving and getting out as a family. So who is this for? All right, so research says that 11 plus is where we wanna be with this. Um, it's basically also for anybody wanting a refresher course on contraception and some reproductive health, right? So it, there's some things have changed <laughs> even in the last couple of years, a lot of things have changed in terms of contraception. And so this could be a good review for anybody. It's also for caregivers, you know, parents, guardians who want to provide their kids with accurate information in regard to preventing pregnancy, right? Preventing pregnancy is one of the um, human rights pieces of sexual health. I mean, I could argue that it all is, but there's a few that really stand out to me. One of those being STI uh, prevention and awareness. Okay. So that would be a major human rights one. Another one is consent. And I feel like the other major one, especially for adolescents is contraception. All right. So uh, as I've said before, everything I do is research-based. So in 2020, uh, Lindbergh and Maddow Zimmet found that sex education about absence and birth control was associated with healthier sexual behaviors and outcomes compared to no instruction. Great. Okay. Uh, and the receipt of formal sex education before the first sex. Okay. This is, you'd be like, why am I teaching my 11 year old this? Well, 12 is the youngest in Canada anyways, that someone can content, consent to sexual activity. And it does indeed happen. Um, although we want to minimize that. And one of the ways that we minimize it actually is through sex ed. Okay. So 
uh, sorry, back to this, receipt of formal sex education before first sex, particularly that include includes instruction about both delaying sex and birth control methods were associated with a range of healthier outcomes among adolescents and young adults as compared with not receiving any instruction. And I will say this over and over and over again, sex ed is the one area <laughs> where we really need it earlier than they need it, right? Because there is, a, it's too late with sex said right there is a it can be too late so you will ultimately decide what ages you would like to share and if you even want to share my material with your kids however I will say I just told my 12 year old downstairs who is a young 12 okay he's a young 12 and I'm super happy about that and I was just like hey everything I'm making is pretty much your age, you're old, you know, you're, you're, you're there. And he was like, mom, and I'm like, well, it's going to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> I asked him if he would subscribe. He said, no. And I'm like, yes, you're going to subscribe. All right. Now the States, okay, has been targeted. And the, I, it's, it's interesting because there's lots of other countries that do abstinence only before marriage sex ed. Okay. There's lots of other ones, but the United States is pretty famous for it. Um, and research shows over and over and over again that abstinence only before until marriage does not work and in fact it leaves a whole bunch of people out so first of all it leaves out all the teens that are having sex <laughs> okay so over half of teens age 15 to 19 are sexually active this does not mean that they are having <clears throat> you know, penetrative sex, but they are sexually active, okay? Most of the decline of teenage pregnancy rates over the past decade, okay, so they have gone down, which is really, really great. Um, they can be attributed to increased contraception use, which comes from education, with a small contribution coming from decreased sexual activity. I've actually seen research where, um, like, so I'm at the time of this recording. Well, actually, I'll just say this. I'm, I was born in 1976. So I grew up in the 80s. I was a teenager during the AIDS epidemic of the 90s. So we really learned a lot about safer sex and that kind of stuff because AIDS was so, HIV and AIDS were so, they, it was just so new and that we didn't have all the medications and all that kind of stuff. And there just wasn't a lot of, of um, uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, do we used to know about it, right? Anyways, so there has been, but over the years, there has been like kids these days are actually having statistically less sex than my generation did in the 90s. It's very, very interesting. Okay, so there is a bit of a downward trend. Um, and I have other theories about that, which I'll make a video about. Okay. Um, but the important thing here is that we address that we need to talk about contraception and STI prevention. Okay, so adolescents, Kohler et al. found out that, uh, discovered that adolescents who received comprehensive sex education had a lower risk of pregnancy than adolescents who received abstinence only or none. And abstinence only, okay, <laughs> I'm very much a human rights-based person, okay? This is very important. It's very important to me. And abstinence only programs threaten fundamental human rights to health information and life, particularly when we're talking about life-altering things like contracting HIV or herpes or having or becoming pregnant as a, as a, as a teenager, as a young person, okay? These are life altering things. And when we deny education about it, we're actually denying education about their human rights. Okay. Sexual reproductive health should be just as important as COVID health, right? Like we spent all the government spent millions, if not billions of dollars on COVID education, yet <laughs> something like contracting HIV, which by the way, the rates are not going down in the world, right? Okay. So depending on where you live in the world, um, we are denying that kind of education. So for more information about STIs, I will link the STI slash BBI um, awareness and literacy in the, um, I was going to say show notes. It's not the show notes. It's in the description. Okay. And lastly, okay. Abstinence only until marriage programs have discriminated against sexual others. So for example, those that do not identify as hetero. So 
abstinence only until marriage programs are heterosexist. Okay. So they assume now, first of all, in the United States, you know, gay marriage um, you can, is legal since 2015, right? So across the board. So in 2010, though, when uh, Elia and Eliason found this, it wasn't. So basically, <laughs> you were saying you weren't allowed to get married, let's say in the United States. And then there was absence only programs that said you couldn't have sex until you got married. So this was a very, I mean, <laughs> Uh, extremely, extremely left out anybody who identifies within the LGBTQ2S plus umbrella. Okay. So, but we're going to change all that here at Rethink. <laughs> okay. <sighs> okay. The United States has one of the highest teenage birth rates amongst other industrialized nations. And some have blamed the U.S.'s more conservative methods of sexual education. So we wanted to know, why is the U.S. so far behind? Well, according to the most recent World Bank data, which measures teen births from girls aged 15 to 19, Europe has most of the world's lowest teen birth rates. Frontrunner countries like Italy, Germany, and Switzerland reported rates below 14 births per thousand people. Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Belgium also had low rates, just five or 16 births per thousand people. Overall, European countries tend to have less than 20 teen births per thousand. Why? Well, Europe's low teen birth rate has been partially attributed to progressive sexual education. One researcher found that in the Netherlands, parents and teachers focus less on the dangers of sex and more on the normal positive aspects. Dutch teenagers are therefore less likely to be secretive and misinformed about their first sexual experiences. Other Northern European countries in particular hold that young people are still rights holders and are entitled to correct and comprehensive sex education. The U.S., by contrast, has one of the highest teenage birth rates of all developed nations, around 30 teen births per thousand. Many believe that this high rate has to do with their more repressive views toward teen sex. In Southern states especially, they teach abstinence-only sexual education, which leaves out key details about pregnancy and diseases. United Nations reports have noted that this kind of education can backfire and contribute to more risky sexual behavior. The U.S. also has a generally more negative attitude toward sex, highlighting the dangers and the risks associated with it instead of the benefits of a healthy, intimate relationship. So does sex ed make a difference? Well, there certainly seems to be a positive correlation between comprehensive sex ed and low teen birth rates. However, not all countries follow this pattern and many scholars still disagree on the best methods to decrease teen births. Some United Nations officials maintain that although the rates of teen sex are unlikely to change, the safety of teen sex can be significantly improved with sexual education. Here we go. All right. The United States. Okay. So the reality is, people, <laughs> the high schools already talk and think about sex. Okay. High schoolers already talk and think about sex. And it's everywhere. Okay. It's on TV and in the movies. It's all over the internet. Okay. It's on social media. It's in popular songs. And they have a natural curiosity. So they're talking about it with their friends. Right. <laughs> right. So even if you don't think that your child should be having sex, talking about them with them about birth control, condoms, and pregnancy is important for their health. So some parents think that, and guardians, sorry, caregivers as well, think that, oh, if I talk to them about it, they'll think that I'm giving them permission to do it. But that's actually not true. Okay. That's actually not true. What happens is they, they can go, oh, this is somebody that I can talk to, right? This is someone I can talk to about this rather than going to very unreliable sources. Okay. Now, if you like showing them this video is a great place to start. And what I do hope is that it will springboard conversation for you. Say, you can say, hey, I watched this. I think it's important that you watch this. If you have any questions afterwards, then you can come and talk. You can even 
have them send you an email, okay? You or you can have like a question box in their house. There's lots of ways that you can have this kind of conversation. Or the best place to actually have a question, like an uncomfortable conversation with your kids is in the car. When you know you have like, a, like let's say it takes 15 minutes to drive to, I don't know, like a lesson or music or, or sports or something like that, right? You know, you have 15 minutes, you know, they're not going anywhere. You have to keep your eyes on the road, right? So it's actually a very good, place to have uncomfortable conversations. So there you go. Pro tip from a, from a parent and counselor. Okay. But now if you are going to, what, what you need to stress is that condoms are the best way to prevent STIs when people do choose to have sex, right? And that a really good method or methods uh, of birth control are the best way to prevent pregnancy. Okay. Um, now your teens, okay, you've probably already discovered this. They're going to make their own decisions when it comes to sex and pregnancy. But it's really important that you understand that what you say to them matters, right? So allow them to make their own decisions. But like, like I've said plenty of times, and we'll reiterate at the begin at the end of this, is that your values come from they come from your family, right? They come and and the, you can stress you can say what they are, right? You can say, well, you know, this is what we how we our family looks at it. That is okay. Now, will they accept it hundred percent? Maybe, maybe not, right? Like teens like to push, right? They like to push boundaries. They like to they're really experimenting with who they are. And some of that involves their rejection of you. It's developmentally appropriate, by the way. Um, just there are certain within certain parameters. Now, but if you choose to say nothing, okay, that leaves them to figure out things out on their own from their peers or from pornography. And over 50% of kids are turning to pornography to learn about sex. And this is extremely problematic because porn is not real sex, right? And this is, again, I have made a pornography literacy video. It will also be linked below. It's an important one for kids to watch if they have already, if they're, you know, 12 plus and if they've already discovered it, okay? It's really, really important that we bust the myths that uh, pornography is selling. Okay. So I do believe that the primary source of sexual health education should come from you. Okay. So, which is why I make these caregiver previews. So you can kind of get set up and see if you're going to show it or not. And then of course I watch the rest of it, but I don't consent for my videos to be shown anywhere else. Okay. So not in schools nor organizations with my explicit written consent. Now, on the other side of that, if you feel um, that what I have to share is valuable to you and your family, I would so much appreciate a like, a subscribe, and then sharing with other parents, guardians, and caregivers who you think could benefit from it, right? It's how the channel grows, but it's also how we start to expand into a culture of consent, which is an overarching mission, mission of Rethink Sex Ed. <clears throat> So because I also believe that you are the one. So every whenever you upload a video to YouTube on the very first page, it says, yes, made for kids, no one not made for kids. Even when I do these for the littles, right? Like when I do stuff for kid, kids in kindergarten and grade three and all that kind of stuff, I'm still going to put not for kids there. And that is so that as long as you have your safe search on, right? Like, so there's all sorts of things. Um, actually, I cover this at the end of the pornography literacy one. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, caregiver preview. <clears throat> There's five things that you can do to increase um, your, or sorry, to decrease the chances of your kids coming across any type of material that they shouldn't based on their age, right? So I always think, no, it's made not made for kids, even though kind of they are, right? So your kids should not accidentally stumble across this stuff um, if your settings are the way they should be, okay? Uh, last but not least, I definitely, definitely appreciate you taking the time to watch this and to consider what I have to offer.